नमस्कार मैं एवरी वन इन दिस वीडियो आई शाल बी डिस्कसिंग द आई पी नेशनल ट्रीटमेंट गाइडलाइन ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी फोर ऑन स्नेक बाइट और स्नेक एनवेनिमेशन इट इज अ प्रिवेंटेबल कॉज ऑफ डेथ इन चिल्ड्रेन स्पेशली इन रूरल एंड फॉरेस्ट एरियाज एंड एज अ रफ एस्टिमेशन इंडिया हैड वन पॉइंट टू मिलियन स्नेक बाइट डेथ्स फ्रॉम टू थाउजेंड टू टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन सो वी कैन सी दैट इट इज अ साइजेबल नंबर एंड दिस इज डिस्पाइट द फैक्ट दैट वी कैन बोथ प्रिवेंट एज वेल एज ट्रीट स्नेक एनवेनिमेशन I urge you people to watch the video till the end because I have summarized some very valuable takeaways at the end. About 300 species of snakes exist in India among which the big four ones are common crate, Indian cobra, saw-tailed viper and Russell's viper which together constitute around 95% of snake bite deaths. These are the clinical features of different kinds of envenomations. and these clinical features basically depend on the complex mixture of enzymes and proteins which are present in the snake venom and which lead to complications so local pain and tissue damage is not seen with crit ptosis and neurological signs are not seen with vipers hemostatic abnormalities are not seen with cobra crit renal complications are seen with hemostatic hemotoxic when uh, snakes like uh, russell's viper and hump nosed viper and response to neostigmine is characteristically seen with cobra so in short you can understand or you can infer from this slide that neurotoxic manifestations are basically seen with cobra and crit and hemotoxic manifestations are basically seen with viper we take a history of the site of bite any fang marks are visible bite whether felt or not snake whether witnessed or not whether the snake bite was painless or painful great bite may be painless or it is felt just as a thorn prick any bleeding from any site in cases of viper any difficulty in breathing dysphagia double vision drooping of eyelids inability to stand up or walk seizures head lag or perioral numbness that is neurological manifestation seen with crate or cobra any anxiety fear sweating or emotional disturbance suggestive of any kind of autonomic dysfunction any early feature of envenomation such as nausea vomiting or abdominal pain any first aid given whether alcohol or tunica whether or not has this this been given when was the last urine voided and what was the color of urine at that time Basically great bites are known to occur at night without pain or fang marks and sometimes pediatricians will consider the possibility of envenomation based on clinical findings only and decide to start anti snake venom so they must do keep this in mind that great bites sometimes present without pain or no fang marks are even visible so when we do the initial assessment we look for secretions and palatal palsy in airway rule out bradypnea shallow breathing seesaw breathing weak cough response and falling single breath count in patient in while evaluating breathing we rule out autonomic disturbances hypotension bradyotachy arrhythmia and cardiac arrest while evaluating circulation we look for altered mental status seizures and neuroparalysis while evaluating disability and we look for fang marks of snake bite bleeding and cellulitis while evaluating exposure A focused examination requires looking for fang marks which are seen as two puncture wounds or two parallel short lines in great bite fang marks may not be easily detectable with no necrosis or pain and may be felt as a thorn prick local cellulitis such as erythema swelling blistering ecchymosis persistent oozing of blood from the bite site compartment syndrome gangrene in delayed presentation and tender regional lymph node enlargement in viper bite measurement of limb circumference and marking the limit of swelling will be useful to track the trend of worsening of the limb swelling due to venom which can occur even in a few hours so this is the photograph and here we can see the fang marks and this is the local cellulitis which is seen muscle tenderness weakness and dark urine may suggest the possibility of rhabdomyolysis and myoglobinuria which leads to dark urine acute compartment syndrome should be suspected based on the presence of five p's and these p's are 
pain on passive stretching, paresthesia, pulselessness, pallor and paralysis seen in the limbs. Focused examination also includes looking for neuroparalytic manifestations which manifest as 6Ds and 2Ps. The 6Ds are diplopia, dilated pupils, dysarthria, dysphonia, dyspnea and dysphagia. And the 6Ps, the 2Ps are ptosis and paralysis of limb and respiratory muscles. As you can see in this picture, the child has bilateral ptosis. In addition, loss of extraocular movements, parietal weakness, pooling of secretions, drooping of jaws may be present and dilated non-reactive pupils with complete paralysis of limbs can be a presentation mimicking brain death, which is simply a sign of great or cobra envenomation. Glockton syndrome characterized by dilated pupils, quadriplegia, and arthria. This may mimic brain death even though there is consciousness. Vertical eye movements are however retained and this is a way, basically this is a way to identify non-verbal communication with these patients of snake venomation. The common, most common investigation we do is a 20 minute whole blood clotting test. This test is basically we take venous sample of around 5.2 ml, 5 ml approximately and then we keep it in a test tube slightly tilted and leave it for 20 minutes at the ambient room temperature and after room temperature we look for whether the blood is still fluid or it has clotted. So if the blood is still fluid, that is it is unclotted, then it is considered to be a positive test and this is because of venom induced consumptive coagulopathy. It is seen with hemotoxic snakes that is vipers. If the test is negative in suspected envenomation, we should repeat the test for the first 3 hours and then 6 hourly for 24 hours to rule out envenomation. ECG is done to identify hyperkalemia and cardiac arrhythmias. We do tests for renal involvement like serum creatinine, hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia and hyperuricemia or hypercalcemia which may be seen especially with hemotoxic, venom, uh, hemotoxic snakes. Tests for abdomyolysis include rapid urine dipstick for blood and or myoglobin RBCs, serum creatinine kinase, electrolytes, calcium, phosphorus, uric acid, blood urine, nitrogen and serum creatinine. Further workup if available should include PTA, PTT, INA, platelet count, FDP, D-dimer, CBC, peripheral smear, retic count, LDH and serum creatinine, especially in patients with hemotoxic envenomation. The first aid involves a small mnemonic. The mnemonic is do it right. Right is the mnemonic. We reassure the patient that 70% of all snake bites are essentially non-venomous and only 50% of bites by the venomous species they envenomate. We immobilize the limb in the same way as a fractured limb by using bandages or cloth to hold the splints. We get to the hospital immediately and traditional remedies have not proven to be of great benefit. So you must take the patient as early as possible to the hospital and tell the doctor of any systemic symptoms such as ptosis. So the mnemonic here is right that is reassure, immobilize, get to hospital and tell the doctor. Incision, suction, electrical shock, cryotherapy and washing the wound are contraindicated. The definitive management of snake bite consists of administering anti-snake venom and the indications for administering anti-snake venom is a prolonged 20 minute whole blood clotting test or presence of clinical bleeding, evidence of neuroparalytic manifestations, local symptoms such as rapidly progressive swelling across a, jo across a joint or local tissue necrosis in the absence of a tunique. When a tunique is applied actually if the swelling persists for one hour even after the removal of tunique, we must attribute this kind of swelling to envenomation that is the presence of venom. Shock in the presence of snake envenomation is also an indication for administering anti-snake venom. Indian anti-snake venom is polyvalent against all the four that is the big four common snakes which I had mentioned earlier. And they are available as both liquid as well as lyophilized forms. Lyophilized form is basically a freeze dried form which we have to reconstitute. For liquid anti snake venom, a reliable cold chain is needed and its shelf life is very short, approximately 2 years. But lyophilized anti snake venom requires to be kept only under cool conditions and not in a refrigerator per se. And it has a relatively longer shelf life of 5 years. Especially, it is useful for being placed in remote areas. Airway management includes 
intubating the patient if required, especially patients with palatal weakness, weak cuff reflex, inability to clear the secretions and with poor respiratory efforts. Ketamine is used for analgesia with atropine pre-medication to reduce the secretions. Muscle relaxants should be avoided and the intubation procedure should be as gentle as possible because bleeding can occur massively. Snake envenomation is one of the reasons for prolonging the duration of CPR beyond 20 to 30 minutes and this is something very good which I have seen in these guidelines because generally we all know that CPR must be continued for a period of minimum 30 minutes before declaring a patient and but snake envenomation is a condition in which we should prolong the duration of CPR even beyond 20 to 30 minutes. Shock should be managed with crystalloids, vasoactivations and blood transfusions and in a comatose child we must check and treat for common causes like hypoglycemia. Imaging may be needed after stabilization to recognize head trauma or intracranial bleeding and if a child is referred with pressure immobilization he or she should be released only after stabilization and administration of anti-snake venom. Massive release of venom may occur and this may cause life-threatening complications including cardiac arrest. The initial dose of anti-snake venom is 10 vials. The lyophilized preparation is dissolved in the reconstituent and is further diluted in 5 to 10 ml per kg of normal saline and administered IV over a duration of 30 to 60 minutes at a constant rate, so preferably by an infusion pump with careful monitoring. The physician should preferably be available bedside. Anti-snake venom test dose is not indicated and it should never be given by the IM or the subcutaneous route. Administration of anti-snake venom can lead to anaphylaxis and that has to be monitored regularly throughout the infusion. Signs of response to anti-snake venom include cessation of bleeding, clotting observed in 20 whole blood clotting, 20 minute whole blood clotting test, improvement in process eye or limb movements and local swelling is not taken to be the pathognomic because it, do, it may take some time to resolve. A repeat dose of anti-snake venom is, include, is indicated after 6 hours of the first dose if bleeding persists or the 20 minute whole blood clotting test remains abnormal in patients with hemotoxic envenomation. In patients with neurotoxic envenomation if paralysis persists for 1 hour after the first dose of anti-snake venom and neostigmine therapy, repeat another 10 vials. The maximum dose is 10, 20 vials therefore, but in viper bites we can go up to 30 vials. So the initial dose is 10, we can repeat the dose of 10 again and in patients with viper bites we can give a third dose of 10 again. So 20 maximum for neurotoxic venoms and 30 is maximum for hemotoxic venom. Uh, hemotoxic venom. If a child is received in a peripheral center with serious signs of envenomation, he or she can be referred to a tertiary care hospital with mechanical ventilator and dialysis facilities because both of these supportive therapies might be required any time during the management of patient with snake envenomation. No anti-snake venom is needed for sea snake bite or pit viper bite provided they are identified correctly as the currently available Indian anti-snake venom does not have antibodies against them. Anti-snake venom can also lead to certain problems. Administration, it can lead to anaphylaxis, which is characterized by sudden dry cough, dyspnea, fall in BP, shock, swelling of face and conjunctiva. A close bedside monitoring and keeping adrenaline loaded with the syringe helps. When the signs of reaction are noted, one must stop the anti-snake venom administration. Administer adrenaline 0.01 mg per kg IM, deltoid or thigh followed by antihistamine IM or hydrocortisone, dexamethasone, IV, oxygen, normal saline bolus if required. Once there are signs of recovery, anti-snake venom is restarted but at a slower rate and is gradually increased to the usual rate under close monitoring. Neuroparalytic envenomation, a trial of AN therapy is warranted following anti-snake venom in all patients with neuroparalytic envenomation and this AN include means atropine neostigmine. So injection of atropine, atropine 0.5 mg per kg followed by injection of neostigmine 0.04 mg per kg is given as initial dose 
and repeat dose atropine 0.05 mg per kg and neostigmine 0.01 mg per kg needs to be given every 30 minutes for 5 doses and all we must stop after 3 doses if no response is seen after 3 doses. Response to neostigmine will be seen in envenomation with post synaptic block as in cobra bites. Positive response to atropine neostigmine trial is measured as 50% or more recovery of the doses in 1 hour. If there is no improvement after 3 doses of atropine neostigmine trial, this indicates probably great bite is there which affects the presynaptic fibers where calcium ion acts as a neurotransmitter. So once we have given 3 doses of AN, we must then give injection calcium gluconate if there is suboptimal response and this is given at a rate of 1 to 2 ml per kg of 10 ml of calcium gluconate 1 is to 1 dilution slowly over 20 minutes as we usually give every 6 hourly and continue till neuroparalysis recovers completely. Acute kidney injury seen in Russell Viper envenomation is caused by hemolysis, direct toxicity, hypotension and rhabdomyolysis. Serial monitoring of blood pressure, urine output, urea creatinine, electrolytes needs to be done. It is to be managed the same way. Control of hypertension, fluid management and referral to higher center where dialysis facility is available may be required. Appropriate anti-snake venom therapy after gi giving blood products after ASV to correct coagulopathy is safer before, safer before dialysis catheter insertion and any kind of renal replacement therapy be it peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis can be done. Compartment syndrome which is most often seen in viper but sometimes also in cobra bite is to be suspected in the presence of 5 P's with significant swelling. And uh, venom induced consumptive coagulopathy is due to procoagulant toxins present in the snake venom which appears within hours and usually resolves spontaneously or after anti-snake venom administration in 24 to 48 hours. It is characterized by prolonged prothrombin time, elevated D-dimer, low fibrinogen levels. Anti-snake venom should be administered as early as possible and other therapies may worsen the coagulopathy. Rhabdomyolysis is associated with viper bite and usual features are raised CPK, hyperkalemia and AKI. It is managed with fluid resuscitation, correction of electrolyte imbalance and dialysis for AKI. Thrombotic microangiopathy is characterized by thrombocytopenia, AKI and features of MAHA that is microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Supportive care, ASV, blood products and dialysis are recommended for the management of the same. There are certain questions which might arise in the mind of the healthcare workers. Like for example, if the patient does not show any signs of envenomation or non arrival, does he or she still need hospitalization? The answer is yes, at least for 24 to 48 hours for observation and the patient must be administered anti-snake venom whenever there is a clinical indication. Up to what day ASP can be considered? This has not been clearly mentioned by the IAP, but it says that if any kind of sign is visible, you give ASV. Otherwise, there is no need. So, I think that it can be given up till whatever time the patient has come to you. What is occult snake bite? Occult snake bite when the patient has not is not aware whether or not a snake bite is there or the physician is not also able to see any distinct fang marks. But the patient presents with acute onset neuroparalysis or acute onset spreading cellulitis in a rural forest or bushy park area environment. And here a physician should strongly suspect and initiate anti-snake venom. What are the responsibilities of referring doctor? Obviously, he should communicate with the receiving center and if possible complete the ASV infusion before transfer. Does accident register entry needed for snake bite? In some states, medical legal entry is mandatory because compensation is given in patients with rural accidents. Supportive management comprises of administration of antibiotics if there is local tissue necrosis, tetanus prophylaxis in the form of tetanus toxoid and tetanus immunoglobulin, analgesia with ketamine, fentanyl or paracetamol and NSAIDs should be avoided to prevent thrombocytopenia and further bleeding. Using blood products without neutralizing the toxins is not preferable and can be used only in life threatening situations. So we must, not we must not use blood products without neutralizing the toxins that is give blood products only after ASV has been given. Surgical consultation should be done when compartment syndrome is suspected because it might require surgical intervention. 
Prevention of snake bite comprises avoiding places where the snakes are likely to live and hide. Attempting to catch, frighten or attack a snake is dangerous. Simple measures such as using torchlight sticks, wearing long boots and avoiding barefoot walk and walking in the darkness can prevent snake bites. Precautions should be taken while cutting grass or picking fruit or vegetables or clearing the base of trees. Sleeping on the ground is to be avoided in the field. Using a bamboo cot or mosquito net can prevent snake bites. Picking up a snake even if it appears to be dead is dangerous. Do not keep livestock, especially children, in the house as snakes may come to hunt them. So if there is a history of snake bite or there is an acute onset flaccid paralysis or acute onset increasing cellulitis. In either case, you must look for fang marks, admit the patient for monitoring at least for observation and other signs of envenomation and perform a 20 minute whole blood clotting test. In case there is no sign of envenomation and the whole blood clotting test is also negative, in that case you must repeat WBCT at periodic intervals and continue the monitoring the patient. If repeated WBCT is negative and the child continues to be stable, you can safely discharge the patient after at least 24 hours of observation. However, in case there are signs of envenomation or positive WBCT, then you must resuscitate the patient according to the physiological status of the patient and administer ASV. In cases with neuroparalytic manifestations, you must assess the need for intubation, give supportive therapy and neostigmine trial. In case a patient has hemotoxic manifestations, you must continue ASV, give supportive therapy and transfuse blood products after ASV and then may consider discharge of the patient in either case if the patient is stable. You must simultaneously also watch for any ASV reaction and in case of reaction you must manage the reaction with adrenaline, histamine and steroid. So this is the flowchart which has been given by IAP. Summarizing the valuable takeaways. Snakes can be poisonous or non-poisonous. Majority of them are non-poisonous and these are sea snakes. Poisonous snakes can have neurotoxic manifestations or hemotoxic manifestations. Neurotoxic manifestations include paralysis, diplopia and even seizures at times. Diagnosis is on the basis of history given by the patient or on the clinical examination of fang marks, local signs like erythema cellulitis, edema and cellulitis as well as other signs like neurological signs in the form of 6Ds and 2Ps. 20 minute whole blood clotting test is a simple bedside test especially helpful for evaluation of hemotoxic envenomation. Treatment is definitive and supportive. Definitive treatment is the anti-snake venom. We give a maximum of 10 plus 10 vials of anti-snake venom but in hemotoxic snakes we can go up to 30 vials in total. No anti-snake venom is required for sea snake bite or pit viper bite. And certain some very valuable things which have come out in these non-national treatment guidelines are the fact that snake envenomation is one of the reasons for prolonging the duration of CPR beyond 20 to 30 minutes. So dilated pupils can be there and you cannot declare a patient brain dead straight away. Snake venom can cause pupillary dilatation hence the patient should not be considered as brain dead. And anti-snake venom test dose is not indicated. Administration of ASV though can lead to anaphylaxis and has to be monitored throughout the infusion and a doctor should sit preferably bedside of the patient being managed. Thank you so very much for a very patient listening and watching and if you like the video please do give a thumbs up and do share the video. Thank you and thanks a lot.